Good evening. My name is Janet Gornick. I'm professor of political science and sociology here at the Graduate Center and director of the Stone Center on Socioeconomic Inequality. And I have the pleasure of welcoming all of you uh, to the Graduate Center of the City University of New York and to tonight's event. And for those of you who are watching via live stream, thank you for joining us. Um, for those of you who are new to our community, let me take a moment or two to tell you about the Graduate Center, the doctoral granting campus of the City University of New York. As our name implies, the Graduate Center is a national leader in graduate education at the master's and especially at the doctoral level. We're one of the largest PhD granting institutions in the country, and we are especially proud to rank among the country's top 10 institutions in awarding doctorates to students from underrepresented groups. The Graduate Center is not just dedicated to advanced education and research, we're also a major contributor to undergraduate education throughout New York City. Each year, our doctoral students teach more than 200,000 of our undergraduates, bringing the resources of the Graduate Center from our seminar rooms into every neighborhood in this city. We're also a place for public conversation. We host a large number of public programs, lectures, and events such as tonight's, and I encourage all of you both here in the audience and on the live stream to follow our public programming schedule throughout the year. The Graduate Center is also home to over 30 research centers and institutes, including the one that I direct, the Stone Center. The Stone Center, uh, there we are an interdisciplinary group of six professors, a small staff, and a growing group of students. Our work is focused on research and education and teaching about the causes and the nature and the consequences of several forms of socioeconomic inequality. Um, and we are very delighted to be the co-sponsors of tonight's panel, inequality. And that brings me to tonight's topic, the recent tax reform. Uh, many of its critics uh, argue that it will have se severely disequalizing consequences and its supporters argue otherwise. I'm confident that tonight's esteemed panelists will help us to sort out fact from fiction on that question regarding the law's distributional effects as well as other potential effects, for example, the on the demand for labor, on capital formation, on the federal budget deficit, and much more. Our moderator this evening is Kathleen Hayes. Uh, as I think uh, you all know, you've been given uh, index cards and we'll have the opportunity to write questions on those cards and the staff at the GC will gather them at about seven past 10 and we'll hand them to Kathleen. So the last few questions will come from the group. Kathleen Hayes is recognized as one of the top economics reporters and anchors in the country. She's covered the US economy and the Federal Reserve for more than 20 years. She joined Bloomberg in 2006 after years as an on-air and online economics correspondent for CNN and for CNBC where she served as host uh, correspondent and commentator for several programs. Kathleen attended Stanford University, where she earned both a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in economics. Kathleen, welcome back to the Graduate Center. She's been on our stage many times, so thank you. <laughs> Kathleen will lead a discussion among our four panelists. As I'm sure you can imagine, I could spend a half an hour introducing each of them, but lucky you, I will not. I'm going to be very, very brief and hope that I haven't wreaked havoc on any of their biographies. Um, suffice it to say that they've all written many papers and books, uh, both uh, within and outside of academia. Uh, going in order across the stage, Larry Kotlikoff is William Fairfield Warren Professor at Boston University and Professor of Economics at Boston University. He's also president of Economic Security Planning, a company specializing in financial planning software. Uh, through his company, Professor Kotlikoff has designed the nation's top ranked personal finance planning software. And in 2014, he was named by The Economist as one of the world's 25 most influential economists. He received his bachelor's degree in economics from the University of Pennsylvania and a PhD in economics from Harvard University. Uh, next, Lily Batchelder the Frederick and Grace Stokes Professor of Law at NYU School of Law and an affiliated professor at NYU's Wagner School. She's also former Deputy Director of President Obama's National Economic Council. Lily's research and teaching focuses on personal income taxes, business tax reform, wealth transfer taxes, retirement savings policy, and social insurance. 
Uh, she received an AB in political science from Stanford, an MPP from the Kennedy School at Harvard, and a JD from Yale Law School. <laughs> Len Berman is Institute Fellow at the Urban Institute, the Paul Volcker Professor and Professor of Public Administration and International Affairs at the Maxwell School, and a Senior Research Associate at the Syracuse University Center for Public for policy research, excuse me. He co-founded, importantly, the Tax Policy Center, a joint project of the Urban Institute and the Brookings Institution, and he's also past president of the National Tax Association. Len holds a PhD from the University of Minnesota and a bachelor's from Wesleyan University. <laughs> and last but not least, I'm happy to introduce my colleague, Paul Krugman, Paul is Distinguished Professor of Economics here at the Graduate Center, a core faculty member in the Stone Center, a LIS Senior Scholar, and as you all surely know, an op-ed columnist for the New York Times. Um, <laughs> he previously, previously taught at MIT, Stanford, and Princeton. He received his undergraduate degree from Yale and his PhD from MIT. Uh, Paul has received many honors, including the John Bates Clark Medal, and the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences in 2008. In the Stone Center, we are impressed by his Nobel Prize, but <laughs> we're really much more excited about the fact that he has 4.33 million Twitter followers. <laughs> Kathleen, I turn the evening over to you. Okay. Uh, and I uh, yeah, everybody can hear me, I think. I can hear my Oh, okay, we, we have to hold these. All right, I wasn't sure. Oh, okay, now you can hear me. So uh, welcome. Um, I'm so happy to be here. I know, um, you know, certainly everyone's agreed you hear all the time about the U.S. tax system, and it's got this wrong with it, and it's got that wrong with it, and of course, so maybe that's at least the good news that we got the ball rolling in Washington, and of course, where is it going to roll and who's it going to roll over is a very big question, and we've got a really great panel to, to look at so many different aspects of this, um, and uh, I think they are aware that uh, you guys are a smart, sophisticated audience, but don't, and when you're writing up your questions, I just want to say, if there's something, don't ever think a question is too simple or obvious to ask. Sometimes those are the best questions to get the best answers. I have to, have to interview people a lot, and I've learned that the hard way. Um, I'd also like to say, I think I'm going to start with Paul. We're going to give everybody a, a chance just to make a broad statement on the tax reform bill, you know, what it means for the economy broadly in, in whatever aspect they choose to address. It's Paul's birthday today. It's also... <laughs> It's also Janet Gornick's birthday. They share the same birthday, among other things. And um, he's so happy about Medicare. This is a perfect, I think that's why he's not celebrating his birthday, because that was the perfect hook to tax reform and budget and everything else. So Paul, since you're the birthday boy on the panel, you could kick it off. Okay, uh, boy, yeah. Not, nothing, nothing says birthday celebration like discussion of tax policy. Uh, okay, so I, I really do want to be brief. Um, the, uh, I think the question we, we're, we're going to talk a lot about the details and, and you know, which, uh, which things that, uh, that they got wrong and uh, if anyone can come up with something, something they got right. Um, but the, um, the question I think, we, the, the really big question is what on earth are we doing cutting taxes at this point? Um, we have a, a U.S. economy which is, we, we have a federal government that is actually at a low point in revenue uh, for, you know, for compared with recent decades. We're at a full employment economy more or less and we have, we're taking in less revenue as a share of GDP than we did the last time we were close to full employment, which in turn was less than the previous time. And meanwhile, um, the U.S. government, as the old saying says, is, is basically a, a, a giant insurance company with an army. Uh, what, what it basically does is it does defense, but then Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security, all of which are largely for uh, older people. Um, and uh, we're getting older. I mean, I'm getting older, but the, but the population as a whole, the, the, uh, the burdens of maintaining the programs that the American people very strongly want is growing, and yet uh, we are 
cutting away revenue. You know, now all taxes have some cost. They have some effects on incentives. They're always, if in isolation, you can always argue that there's some benefit from cutting some tax, but um, uh, you have to raise, you have to pay for things somehow. And is there any plausible story by which this tax cut at this time makes sense? It's something is gonna have to give and um, and this is only making what was already a problematic situation of paying for the government we want uh, even harder. Len, Len we'll, 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 we'll let Larry go last. I mean, yes, Larry's going last. Len's next. Okay. All the L's, uh, three L's. I think she should be on. Just try. Okay. Thank, thank you. Uh, okay, well, I like tax reform. Tax reform is in the title of this panel and a lot of the advocates for this bill which, by the way, is not called the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Uh, the Democrats were mad, and they struck. They were able to strike the name of the law from from the legislation. It's actually a tax act pursuant to reconciliation under Section blah blah blah. Uh, so we have to come up with a different name for it. It's the tax bill, the tax act that shall not be named, or tax tax Voldemort. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I, I like tax reform. I think we needed tax reform. The tax code was unfair, uh, inefficient, needlessly complex, wasn't raising enough revenue to pay, pay for the government. This isn't tax reform. Uh, the, you think about the key challenges that we're facing the country. One is red ink for as far as the eye could see. The Congressional Budget Office was already projecting $10 trillion in deficits over the next decade. Uh, another issue, which I think was a big factor in the 2016 election, was wage stagnation. The fact that low and middle income people haven't seen increases in real wages in decades. Uh, it is true that our corporate tax rate is high by international standards, uh, and there's a problem with a lot of loopholes and inefficiencies in the code that uh, were both unfair and undermining economic growth. So what did we do? Well, we added one and a half trillion dollars in deficits uh, if you account for the effects of the short-term economic stimulus, maybe it's $1.3 trillion. Uh, the bill is regressive. Most of the benefits go to people with very, very high incomes. Uh, it did cut the corporate tax rate, uh, but it also cut the tax rate on unincorporated businesses, which nobody before this thought were, were overtaxed. And what it did was create the biggest new loophole, in, certainly in my memory. So I think and, and as Paul mentioned, it's an absolutely insane time to enact an economic stimulus, uh, and certainly one that doesn't do, really do much good. I mean, you could imagine investing in infrastructure, uh, but that's not what this bill does. Uh, so what the bill did was, it, it actually did what the Republicans wanted, which is they needed to get a legislative victory. They got it, they got a two for it. They were able to undermine the Affordable Care Act too, uh, but it didn't make the tax code better. And the, you know, there's no, if there's a positive aspect to it, it's that it could do what Reagan's 81 tax cut did, which is mess up the tax code so much that it could build, okay. uh, build some momentum for tax reform five years down the road. Okay, Lily. Well, perhaps I'm piling on, but um, like Len, I have been a big fan of tax reform for a while and have really wanted to see it happen, um, but this bill, I think, generally moves in the exact opposite direction than it should have. Um, we should have been looking at uh, raising somewhat more revenue to deal with our long-term fiscal issues and the fact that the baby boom generation is retiring. We should have been looking at trying to support the middle class and low-income workers and invest in them and perhaps ask the wealthy to pay a bit more. And this bill is very heavily tilted towards the wealthy and basically all of the tax cuts that uh, to any extent benefit the middle class and low-income families expire. Um, and then, of course, by raising budget deficits, it's putting pressure on cutting social programs down the line. And then it's also a bill that was rushed through incredibly quickly. And so there are a number of really severe technical issues with it um, that the Treasury Department and IRS are just beginning to work through. Um, but usually one thinks of tax reform as simplifying the tax code. Um, and in most respects, I think this really goes in the opposite direction. As Len mentioned, there's this new pass-through deduction, which some people have called the biggest new loophole in the code, and is going to create enormous amount of complexity for people figuring out not just how to file their taxes, but how to plan their whole affairs in order to minimize their tax liability. So I think it's a squandered opportunity and wish we'd done sort of the reverse. Okay, and I kind of purposely saved Larry for last because he has some different points to put on the table. 
well, th thank you. It's great, uh, great to be here. Thanks for everybody, everybody to, for coming. So, um, I think the tax reform has gotten uh, too much good press and too much bad press. I think I agree with the other panelists on the good press that uh, we ignored the fact that the country is absolutely broke. We've got enormous amounts of off the book debts that are not incorporated in the official debt. So if you add all those in, you've got a $200 trillion debt, not a $20 trillion debt. So we absolutely needed to have much higher revenues coming out of this tax reform, and that didn't happen. I think that the, uh, the panelists are overstating how much of a deficit, uh, addition to the official debt this uh, bill will produce, because I think if you simulate it with uh, more sophisticated uh, global simulation models of the kind I've developed with some colleagues, you find that uh, there is gonna be a, a significant, I believe, increase in capital formation in the country, probably about a 15% increase over time in the stock of capital, probably about a 5.5% increase in wages. And I think that's gonna offset to a large extent the uh, what would otherwise be an increase in the debt to GDP ratio. So I don't see this tax bill, which has a, uh, which the Joint Committee on Taxation says is gonna produce a $1.4 trillion extra deficit over 10 years as, as being a, a big increase in this huge problem. Uh, 1.4 trillion over 10 years is about 0.6% of GDP per year. Uh, and it, that's not a huge thing compared to the, to the, the, the really big problem, which is, is these unfunded liabilities are getting bigger every year by collectively about six trillion dollars. So 1.4 trillion versus six trillion, over 10 years versus six trillion per year, big difference. Now on fairness, I think here again, I think that the methodologies that have been used or have me, are being used by the government and by the think tanks in Washington are really outdated. They're about 40 years old. They compare young people who are gonna pay taxes in the future with old people who've already paid their taxes. They're looking just at people in a, as a snapshot. They don't look at their future taxes, just their current taxes. Taxes. When you look at everything, I think the way modern economics says to do it, I think this tax reform basically did not increase inequality. It's basically fair uh, in the sense that uh, the share of spending, which is ultimately the bottom line at the top 1%, within each age group will get to do, hasn't changed much, won't change much at all. Uh, the share of the, of the taxes that they'll pay won't change. The absolute amount of tax benefits to the rich will be larger, much larger than to the poor because they're paying a lot of taxes to begin with. Okay. But anyway. <laughs> yeah. I think, yeah, and I, so now we've, now we've set the table for you. And we're going to drill down on a lot of these points. I think so. you guys are going, wow. That, believe me, we're going to come back to a lot of this because everybody touched on very, very important aspects of this. And I, I really want to start on the supply side because I think that when you, the supply side, companies, um, are they going to invest more and will that make their workers more productive? Maybe they will even hire more workers. And this is one of the promises, I think, of people who support this, cutting the corporate tax rate. I'm sure there are even people who, who defend the pass-through, the biggest loophole, right? Um, and I think one of the biggest counter-arguments from the very beginning has been, at least where U.S. companies are concerned, they're already holding lots of cash, and they have been for a while, and they haven't been investing it. So why would you think that cutting the corporate tax rate is now going to spur some big amount of investment. So I really want to start again on, on this aspect of, okay, and let's, let's, let, let's let Larry start this time, because he is arguing we're going to have capital formation, we're going to, and it's going to come a lot from foreign sources. So how is this going to work? Specifically, what do you see? And then we're going to let everybody else uh, say, tell us what they think of that. Well, well, we've lowered our effective marginal corporate tax. Arguably, there's different estimates, but the estimates, I think, are probably the most credible. We've lowered it from about 34.6% down to about 18.8%. We've, we've given a huge giveaway to um, owners of existing capital in the process. This is not a tax reform I would have penned up. You know, it's not something I, I give it a B minus, which is a pretty high grade for, you know, uh, so it's not like I'm trying to defend what happened. I'm just trying to say, here's what I think this, here's what I think uh, the right sim simulation model suggests. There was a big, cut in effective tax rates. 
uh, of investing in the U.S. Uh, I think we're going to get a lot of capital coming in from abroad as a result of that, and a lot of capital staying in the U.S. that would otherwise have gone abroad. And I think that's going to have a modest impact on, on wages, about 5.5%, over maybe 8, 10 years. We'll have, wages will be 5.5% higher, and I think that's a good thing. The, the, the point you, you made about um, the fact that corporations have been sitting on a lot of cash, I think, I think that's a little bit off base because when a corporation has a lot of cash, they, plant, they park it somewhere in a bank and they get some interest, and then the bank can lend it out to some other corporation to invest. Uh, so I think what we need to concern ourselves with is not uh, you know, which particular corporation is investing. We have to understand that our country as a whole is not investing for itself. Our consumption rate is extremely high. Our national saving rate is only about 4%. Our domestic investment rate is 5%. So about 1% of national income is coming, is being invested from abroad into the U.S. We need to raise that because we can't, or we need to get our own saving rate up. So we're saving too little. If we're going to get more capital in our country more, and raise productivity of workers, we have to get capital from abroad. This reform moved in that direction. That's a good thing. Okay, who wants to jump in? Paul, you raise your hand first. Yeah, you go I, I, I have to say, um, uh, it's, it's one of those kind of sad things. I actually have been having fun with the economics of this stuff. because, and, and there is a model. There is a, a style of analysis which says, okay, it's a global capital market. In the end, uh, capital will come in. You're great lowering the marginal uh, tax rate on capital, so we'll, there will be more f capital formation in the U.S., and so we will have a bigger economy in the long run as a result of this. And there has to be some truth to that. There is, some of this is going to happen. But then there's a series of qualifications. First of all, it's in the long run. This is going to take a long time. If we're, if we're talking about capital coming in from abroad, we're talking about uh, the counterpart of that is really big trade deficits. So this is a bill that, if it works, if it does what it's supposed to, it's a bill that produces huge trade deficits for a decade or more. Um, and and um, those trade deficits would have to happen through a strong dollar, which in itself will deter investment. So it, this, this is a, a long, slow process, even if it works as advertised. Then there's a whole series of things that you want to sort of gear that down. Uh, a lot of corporate profits in the United States are not a return to capital. They are a return to monopoly power. And you cut taxes on monopolies and you're not generating new investment that's going to raise wages, you're just cutting taxes on monopolies. And that's a, a big issue, but we're, that's looking larger and larger. The United States is not small in the world. If we are attracting a lot of capital, we're going to be driving up rates of return all around the world, not just here. Um, and the last point, and this is something I've been beating on that I have been having trouble getting people. Uh, um, this money doesn't come free. If foreigners invest here, they're going to be doing it because they're expecting a return. So the net benefit to U.S. residents is only the difference. It's, it's the, basically the tax wedge. Uh, now I'm falling into jargon, but it's, a, it's, it's the, the growth in gross domestic product, the amount of stuff we produce here, is a very bad measure of the benefits to the U.S. because a lot of that is going to end up being income paid to foreigners. Plus, foreigners already own something like a third of the equity in the United States. So we're cutting taxes on that. So we're, and it's not at all clear, once you've put all that together, that even in the long run, we're going to be raising the income of the United States. And in any case, it's, I, I think all of those things that gear it down make this a much, much smaller thing even, I don't know whether it's plus point whether it's plus 1% or minus 1% on the U.S., but it's, uh, again, given the, the, the fact that we're exacerbating a, a deficit problem when we really shouldn't be doing that, why? Okay, I can tell Lily, Lily she, she, made it, she picked up hers first, you go, Lily. <laughs> So I, I think there could have been a way to do business tax reform that would have um, been helpful modestly for the economy in the long term. We had a, uh, we did have a relatively high uh, statutory rate, and there's reasons to believe that corporations sort of fixate that on that when making investments. So we could have broadened the base, lowered the statutory rate, and done that on a revenue neutral or even revenue positive basis. And I think that you know wouldn't have been a panacea, but would have been helpful for the economy in the long term. Um, the problem with this bill is that it loses a huge amount of revenue, and uh, that may, you know, have a small effect on growth in the short term. It's not, as Paul said, a particularly wise time to enact an economic stimulus. Um, but the estimates by nonpartisan estimators like the Congressional Budget Office are that those even small positive growth effects disappear over time and potentially reverse. 
And then their models don't account for the fact that this has to be ultimately paid for. And so when we ultimately pay for it by either um, raising taxes in the future or cutting spending programs, that's likely to be a drag in growth as well. Um, so once again, I think this is just really a missed opportunity um, that we uh, could have enacted something much more positive. Just uh, a couple of additional points. One is when, uh, when Larry said that we're not using sophisticated models. It's certainly true TPC isn't because we can't afford to build these models, but the, uh, we've worked with other people like Ken Smetters who'd worked with Larry and Alan Auerbach in the past and he has a, a very sophisticated overlapping generations model. Uh, the Joint Committee on Taxation spent many years and millions of dollars building models that built on work that Larry and others have done. None of those models produce the kind of big macroeconomic effects that some of the advocates have been hoping for. And I should also say that even though in, in theory you could imagine a rush of new investment, you know, the, the, I think the biggest pro-investment aspect of this bill is the provision that allows companies to immediately deduct the cost of new investments, so-called expensing. And it will encourage them to invest more. And if they do a lot of that, it would make workers more productive. It could raise wages. But it's an empirical question. And if you look at the empirical data, uh, you don't see huge responses to even major tax reforms among countries or even within the United States. And it's just, I, I, on some level, I think it's a good thing because if you really needed a good tax system for the economy to succeed, we would have been in a depression for the last hundred years. <laughs> uh, the other thing is just on, on the point of windfalls the, and, and Paul's point about uh, foreigners, the tax rate cut a large part of the benefit goes to those foreign holders of U.S. equities. We just shipped, you know, billions of dollars overseas, and it's not going to do anything good for us uh, in the short run or in the long run. The other thing is, when you look at the effects of cutting tax rates, uh, you also need to consider how other countries will respond. In 1986, we cut our corporate tax rate, and for a few months, we had the lowest rate among our trading partners, England, uh, France, Germany, all of them cut their rates in response, and that reduced the, the effectiveness of the corporate tax rate cuts. I, actually, I just want a quick, um, everybody talks, 86 is, is the, you know, the Camelot of tax reform. Everyone talks about how wonderful it was. You cannot, if you look at the growth rates of U.S. potential output, look for supply side benefits, you cannot find it. So the, the best tax reform that we ever did, the one that everyone is, it talks with awe about how, how, how did something so good happen in Washington, even that one didn't do anything that we can, we can actually see in the data. But well, you're only talking about in practice. In theory, it was great. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Larry, take it away. Okay, I, I think you guys are giving supply side economics a bad, a bad rap here. Uh, the, um, so not all economic models are kind of E equally useful for every question. And so this, the models that, the model that uh, Len is referring to that Ken Smetters, former co-author of mine, developed for, and is being used, using it for the uh, Tax Policy Center, is really a closed economy model where it's a model of the U.S. and he runs it two ways. One is in which there's no rest of the world at all he gets a result, and then he runs it as if the U.S. was a small, open economy, a tiny economy like Bermuda, and he gets a result, and then he averages two results, which are, I love Kent, I think he's a fantastic economist, I was talking to him yesterday, he's a great buddy of mine, but I think those are two wrong answers that he's averaging. If you average two wrong answers, you're going to get the wrong answer. Uh, the Joint Committee on Taxation, I was looking at their simulation study today, which also suggests very little economic impact. Uh, it's similar in many ways to what Kent's doing. It's kind of very ad hoc. Uh, what I did with some economists actually from Russia. Uh, look out. Look out, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but well before we even knew uh, Trump was running for president, uh, I worked with some economists at the Guidor Institute uh, in, in Moscow for the last three years. We've been putting together a global life cycle simulation model so it's like the model that Ken has and that JCT has, except it's got all the other regions of the world. It's got 17 regions of the world, not just one region. And uh, so all the countries of the world are combined into 17 regions. And each one's demographics is modeled and their fiscal policies are modeled. So 
in the end, and also their productivity growth and their catch up. So, I mean, for example, China, we're, we're adding to the world population two Chinas in the next 35 years, three Chinas by the end of the century. They're being located mostly in South America, in South Africa, in Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, the Middle East, and in India. All these things matter to the evolution of the world capital market. And so you need to have all these elements in there and the aging in the, in, in the developed countries, all that stuff in there to really understand how much capital is going to be available to flow into the U.S. So I don't think you can take the existing models, you know, let's say my model with my colleagues, the TPC's model, the JCT models, the CBO's model, and just average them and say, well, the consensus is somehow in the middle. I think some models are better for certain questions than others, and uh, I like our model. The, um, uh, Lily, Lily said that uh, there was a huge revenue loss from this uh, reform. Well, the static revenue loss by the JCT is over 10 years. People didn't kind of catch, catch that. It's not over one year, it's 1.4 trillion. It seems like a big number, but GDP over 10 years is gonna be probably $250 trillion. So we're talking about 0.6% of GDP on an annual basis. So it's not nothing, and, that, and Paul and everybody else is absolutely right that we needed to have a revenue uh, increase of probably 4% of GDP forever to try and deal with what's coming and the bankruptcy that we're inflicting on our children. I agree with that, but I don't think we should overstate what just happened. I think we're gonna have capital inflows. I think we're gonna have a wage increase. Uh, it is true that there's been a giveaway to certain monopolies, but I still think U.S. workers are going to get a wage increase, five and a half percent, probably by within eight years, one time, not forever, not every year. And, uh, you know, otherwise we kind of agree. Can I make a really quick point, which is I really think we're underestimating the revenue loss from this bill. The, uh, it looks like it's smaller than it than, than is intended by uh, its advocates because most of the provisions expire in 2025. People in Congress have said that they're absolutely promising they're going to extend it and make it permanent. And the revenue loss is understated over the long run because there's this one-time windfall from taxing foreign profits that have been held overseas and that's not going to, that's not going to be repeated. It can't be, uh, you know, maybe it's small relative to the size of the problem, but Will Rogers once said that when you find yourself in the hole, the first thing to do is to stop digging. And we're in a big hole. One more thing to sure, add go ahead, to that. Um, in addition to, you know, politicians are already saying we're going to extend all the expiring provisions, which would lift the cost of this bill over $2 trillion. There's also good reason to believe that the estimates are, are low balls. And this is not an insult at all to the Joint Committee on Taxation, which I think does extraordinary work. But we've already seen a number of states around the country, for example, talk about how they're going to try to um, get around the limitation on state and local tax deductions. Um, it seems um, very likely that something like this pass-through deduction, there'll be a lot more gaming that ever could have been anticipated. So I think the modelers do their best job to guess how this will be gamed, but when you put you know, all of the best tax lawyers in the country on the case, they're gonna find ways to really expand that. I'd like to ask a very unsophisticated question, um, and don't blame it on my Stanford um, education and economics, but I'm thinking, you know, people, if you look at, for example, we saw this, there's been a big, uh, consumer confidence has, has seems to have been hit by tax cuts in, in a positive way. We saw the big uh, rally in equities, which is probably going to continue. Big optimism that, yes, this is going to make a difference, and business confidence. And so, you know, riddle me, riddle me that. Answer me that. Is, the, are all, is, is that whole sense that people have and businesses have that, dang, they're going to cut taxes. This is great. We pay too many taxes. And, of course, most people seem to feel that anyway, right? But, I mean, what, what's the, what is, is there going to be any impact from that? Plus, the other part would be, oh, my God, even if I get a little cut in my taxes, I'm going to spend that. If I, and, you know, some, who's going to spend more, rich people or poor people? Well, who knows? But there's, there's that aspect to it, too. And if I'm a worker, I think I might say, well, you know, so what, so what if, if rich people got a big tax cut and they get way more money back than I did, if they hire people, if my wages go up, if I'm doing better at the, at the end, even if, you know, five years, whatever, then I don't care if those rich people got that got. You see, so how do you answer all those? How do you fit those in? Um, I don't know whether you're, uh, let, let me just say, uh, now we're mixing in demand side 
with supply side. So one question is, how much is this going to expand the economy's ability to produce? And the answer is probably a little, although I'm not sure, but you know, in this we're, um, you know, uh, we each of us loves our own model, but I, I actually think that it, it, uh, um, it I, I don't, I don't buy the ones that give you huge gains, but I, I admit there's some, certainly, potential GDP will rise. But the immediate thing is, well, yes, there's gonna be more spending, we think, probably. But, and that would have been a great thing if this was happening in 2010, when we had 9.5% unemployment. Now we have 4% unemployment. Um, it's, uh, we don't know how much lower it can go. Wages are still not rising, but on the other hand, a lot of other indicators, things like quit rates are suggesting that this really looks like a, and in, in some ways it doesn't matter what the reality is. What matters is the, is the mind of Jay Powell, the, the new chairman of the Federal Reserve, who will respond to any faster economic growth by hiking interest rates faster, which means that most of this stuff is gonna have very limited effects. It, it, whatever increased consumer confidence and so on is really just not gonna do very, very much for growth. It's, it makes, it's a world of difference uh, for when you have a deficit spending in a depressed economy, when you have deficit spending in, in a full employment economy. Uh, I just add that the, um, you know, what people say in consumer confidence surveys, what small businesses say, even what stocks do is one thing. We're still waiting to see whether this translates. And for what it's worth, orders for capital equipment have not gone up at all. So the, the first early indicator of an investment surge is just not happening yet. Now it's, you know, it's two months in, but still, we're not seeing it yet. Just on the, the stock market surge, I mean, you would have expected that just based on the rate cuts or all these companies that have made it. It's that windfall that we were talking about companies made decisions assuming that their income would be taxed at 35% and now all that income is taxed at 21%. That automatically raises the value of a lot of profitable companies. Uh, that's not something, that's a, that's a one-time one shift up. I'm not, I mean, if I could predict stock prices, I'd be a lot richer than I am. <laughs> uh, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't count on that, at that continuing. The other thing is, you know, there's been this rash of good news that people have talked about as evidence that the that the tax cuts are working, wages are going up, companies are paying bonuses. That is what you would expect to see at this stage in an economic cycle. Uh, labor market's getting tight, companies want to keep their workers, bonuses make more sense than wage increases because you're not committing to pay a higher compensation in the future and there's a lot of uncertainty about whether we might be going into an economic downturn. And you have to pay higher wages to attract, to attract more workers and of course, if you're a big corporation and you're doing this and you want to curry favor with the president, you say, oh yeah, the tax cuts made me do it, but we would have seen that anyway. Right, yeah. I'm talking a bit, but I, I, had, I had a little bit Your of birthday. fun with a blog post yesterday. <laughs> um, um, talking about how uh, on February 19th, Walmart announced big wage increases for you know, half a million workers and the, the tax cut is working. And I said, oh wait, actually that's a, that was February 19th, 2015. <laughs> there's always somebody increasing wages somewhere and there's every incentive to say the tax cut did it. Okay. I think it's helpful maybe to distinguish here between the direct effects of the tax bill and the indirect ones. So if you look just at the direct effects on, on uh, employees' compensation uh, or taxes on their wages for employees, um, so you're not looking at the business provisions of the bill, then you see this is an incredibly regressive bill. Um, for example, a household earning forty to fifty thousand dollars on average is getting a tax cut of maybe four hundred something dollars. Um, a millionaire is getting an average tax cut of twenty seven thousand dollars. So then you can add on the indirect effects and the Joint Committee on Taxation that we keep talking about, which is the official nonpartisan scorekeeper for Congress. Um, they incorporate those indirect effects and they assume that. 25% of all the corporate tax cuts are going to benefit labor. And even when they incorporate those effects, they still find that the bill, the tax cuts for the wealthy are three times or more larger than they are for the middle class. Now, do you mean in absolute, to absolute terms or, you know, how, I mean. This is as a share of their income. A share of income. Yeah, yeah, it's still, so if you're a millionaire, you get three times as much as a share of your income of tax cuts, even if you assume that a bunch of that corporate tax rut, it, cut is accruing to the benefit of employees. And that's just in the near term. If you look at the long term, when all of these individual provisions expire, um, you find that every income group earning less than $75,000 on average loses out. 
Um, now you could say, well, the Republicans are already saying they want to make those individual provisions permanent, but it's still regressive if they were permanent, plus you eventually are going to have to pay for these tax cuts, and that's probably going to make the effects more regressive. Okay, and I did, before I let you jump in, I want to let remind you, and this is your time, there are going to be uh, cards passed around, so um, you can start writing questions now. We're going to keep going with the panel for a while, but um, whatever is on your mind that you really want to hear, you know, developed or whatever, or even something maybe you haven't heard us touch on yet, you, you're, now's your time to start writing down those questions. Go ahead, Larry. Yeah, uh, I don't think that this tax reform is regressive or uh, where we define regressivity the way you know economics defines it as you know what what look what happens to the uh, pattern of lifetime of tax rates net tax rates as you go up the resource distribution what happened is all the tax rates declined and what that means is that uh, every you know a little bit not a whole lot actually and what that means is that uh, since the rich have more resources to begin with, the same percentage decline in their tax rate means a bigger absolute tax break. So, but we wouldn't define uh, that as regressivity. We'd say uh, if the pattern of the tax rates hasn't shifted, hasn't become steeper or flatter, the thing is still as progressive as it was. Another way to look at this is look at the inequality in spending. Are the top 1%, if you look within any cohort, going to be spending as a result of this tax reform, incorporating the, the wage increase or not incre incorporating it? And by the way, I, I'm assuming in my analysis that the changes are permanent, just to be clear. Uh, the, the share of spending of the top 1% uh, stays almost unchanged. The share of the taxes that they pay change, stays almost unchanged. So I think that we're actually branding this reform incorrectly. I think we're re branding it as incredibly regressive, as not going to have any economic impact. I think what we should say is it's you know, a second-rate reform, not because of those concerns, but because it didn't raise revenue and because it's probably going to undermine public education dramatically in all the blue states around the country and because it's probably going to dramatically undermine Obamacare and lead to another 10 million people uninsured. And those are the real concerns with this tax reform. But, but, but the, the reforms we're focused on, I think we're, we're just kind of, uh, kind of overdoing it. It's, not, it's just not true. That it's, I don't think it's true that this thing is not going to have a good economic impact or be highly regressive. I just don't think that's uh, I just want to really push back on this notion that it's not regressive. I, I absolutely agree that it... Um, we should not look at regressivity in dollar terms. So if okay. you know every household, whether they're a millionaire earning twenty thousand dollars, got a thousand dollar tax cut, I I wouldn't think of that as a regressive tax cut. But if you look at the official estimators and at the percentage change in after tax income, it is much much larger. It's three times larger for the wealthy as a share of their income than it is for the middle well, class. The official so estimators, to me, that's the, definition. the official estimators by the JCT, the TPC, they're all looking at kind of the wrong calculation, sorry. They're looking at what I'm paying in taxes this year as a share of my income this year, but I'm gonna be paying taxes the rest of my life. And they're, they're throwing together 20 year olds and 80 year olds. Uh, you get a, a totally distorted picture of progressivity um, by looking at uh, taxes that way when our profession has just moved along over the last 40 years. We're doing tax analysis the way we did it 40 years ago. But people are going to be affected by this tax through the rest of their life. And young people are going to have to pay taxes in the future. They should get credit for that in the analysis. And old people uh, aren't going to be, you know, have already paid their taxes. So you should compare people within their same age group. And when you do that, you just don't get this kind of picture you're describing. I'll say, uh, the paper is going to be posted at kotlikoff.net. It's joint with Alan Auerbach. He's certainly no Republican. I'm certainly no Republican. And we'll have that on, the, on our website, okay. my website, kotlikoff.net, in about a week. I think it's going to be the best uh, modern analysis of this. Okay. Yeah. I, I just want to say, I don't, I, I, it's impossible in, to, to settle this thing. But, but, I, I, but there's a, there's a, a really... A dual. It, you're wrong, but it's impossible for us to settle this, right? Uh, but just, just what's really critical me, here is to say, and I think this is, is, is very important to some, uh, that 
um, you know, the revenue loss uh, will have to be offset somehow. And if you try to think about where that comes from, it's going to mean less spending on, on social programs. So if we actually ask what is going to happen to after tax and transfer distribution of income, then it's clearly regressive. Doesn't, all of these other things in a way f pale beside the fact that, that, that this is going to further impoverish a government that's having trouble paying for the programs we have. I agree so with that. L Larry did one thing when he was talking about this, which I, I, I guess I want to I want to respond to. It's this idea about the share of taxes that are being paid by each income group, and the argument was, well, the high income people are still paying the same share. I don't think that's right. But even if it were true, this is a deficit finance tax cut, and what we're doing is we're cutting the most progressive elements of the tax system: the individual income tax, corporate tax, estate tax, uh, and relying relatively more on regressive taxes, payroll taxes, excise taxes, and, and of course whatever taxes are coming to offset this or spending cuts are coming to offset it over the long run. The other thing is just in terms of which is the right model to use. I, you know, I, I really applaud the effort that you and Alan went to to try to build a life cycle model, but there are some heroic assumptions that are built into that. I think, I haven't looked at it in a while, but the I think you started with the survey of consumer finances. Is that right? It's like 4,000 records or so. So that's 6,000 records. What, yeah. Okay, so you're, and you're creating lifetime profiles, which requires a whole lot of assumptions, and it produces the results you described. The last time we actually looked empirically at data over time and to try to see whether that was uh, a lot different from what you get when you look at a, a single year's data was a paper by Joel Sumright. It's quite old because the IRS hasn't released panel data in a long time. But what they found was that uh, looking at a single year's data and looking at uh, data averaged over uh, a number of years, it, it did, uh, the averaging over time reduced the overall regressivity of the tax system or, uh, or of tax changes, but the differences were relatively modest. I would love to, there are panel data behind closed doors at the IRS, and it'd be really nice to be able to look at actual data for taxpayers over 20 years, and I think that would help to resolve this question. Just get in touch with some Russians, and they'll just hack right in and... <laughs> Quick response? <laughs> sure. By the way, I, can I just... I, I, I don't think we've spent enough on Lily's point about the, uh, you know, the gaming of the system. Okay. That with, this, is, this is a wildly... I mean... Um, this was literally, you know, written in, in, a, in a few hours in the dead of night, uh, and it, it's uh, and with probably bad thinking, even if they had more time. And 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 now, there's one thing America really leads the world in is is in smart uh, tax lawyers and accountants, and the, the the havoc they're going to be able to wreak, exploiting all of the loopholes that were created in this legislation, is going to mean that the the true cost will probably be a lot bigger than we're ta we're talking about. Did you want to well, just, that? just really briefly back to, to, to briefly yeah. the you, you you don't know exactly what's coming so you really want to look at kind of the ex, expected impact of this bill on people uh, so you want to look at where they are what they're likely to earn in money and what their assets are and uh, project things forward and and including their spending so I think we're doing exactly the right way I don't think that looking at actually realized outcomes in the future would would capture what we're trying to get at when we're trying to assess the progressivity of the uh, lifetime pro progressivity of this system. You really do have to do a projection for it to be a sensible analysis. Okay, let me. You, in in terms of uh, the gaming, well, I guess it mainly in terms of accountants and lawyers making out on this, which they always seem to. You know, it's a great career path, right? Um, but it, it seems that one aspect is gaming, the other one is if, if it gets more complicated instead of more simple, and of course that was one of the hopes, and Paul Ryan was going to make it simple enough to put on a, a postcard, right? Um, <laughs> very big postcard. Yeah, the jumbo postcard. <laughs> right, right. So, so is that part of the, and does, does everybody agree that this is not a more simple, or do you see simplification in here? There, there's certain simplification elements at the personal side, but yeah, I, I think the pass-through stuff is very complicated. I don't think it's going to have as big a game play. You know, I think it's going to be great for Do Donald Trump. I think he probably gave up Bannon to get all those real estate provisions. 
But I think for most people, there's not much of a game there because they've got all kinds of counterfeit, countervailing things. You know, you try and take it, but then you got, you can't meet this criteria. So I don't know how big of a, uh, a game that will be to play. I certainly try to play it, and I can't, can't figure out how to do it. <laughs> I mean, I think there's going to be huge and already are huge gaming opportunities. So we've you know, already seen, even just in the few days after it was enacted, everybody was debating, should I prepay my pop my property tax? And now I mean, they all were these... Gonna, there was some debate at the IRS how much they would let right, people do that. whether that, that yeah. would work. And nobody knew. And they had, you know, they were trying to figure this out over the holidays. And now all these states are trying to figure out how can we avoid the limitation on the state and local tax deduction. And it's unclear if that's going to work legally and which versions are going to work legally and whether it's going to be worth it for an employer to take up the election if the state creates it. Um, and then the one, probably the thing uh, that worries me the most is this pass-through deduction um, because it's, it's generally um, providing the largest benefits to the wealthy. So the top 1% earns 50% of pass-through business income. I'm not sure everybody is, uh, even yeah, here yeah, yes. knows what the pass-through <laughs> okay. deduction is, right? So, so the pass-through deduction is a 20% deduction if you get income from a pass-through business, which means it's... And what's a pass-through business? Which, <laughs> which means it's a sole proprietorship, so you just own your own business, you're the only owner. Doctors? Um, partnership. Partnerships? Or something called an S-corporation. So it's basically not, not a doctors. kind of not business. Doctors don't get it? Wait, how they lose out? Not economists. <laughs> well, no, some doctors do. But... Um, but it's basically a kind of business where it doesn't pay the corporate income tax separately. Instead, all of its profits are immediately taxed to all of its owners. And so Donald Trump has, uh, by reports, over 100 pass-through businesses. And lots of huge businesses are structured this way. There's also small businesses that are structured this way. And the provision says that for all that business income, you can write off 20%. But there's a few guardrails um, if you're higher income. The problem is they're probably not going to have a lot of force. And um, then the other problem is that you cannot get this if you're an employee. So uh, if you, know, you work at a department store and you say, okay, why doesn't you know, Bloomingdale's pay Lilly LLC? Then why can't I get this pass-through deduction? I can't because I'm still an employee. The only way I can do that is if I become an independent contractor, which you might think, okay, maybe that's worth the hassle. But in the process, you're probably going to have to give up all your employee benefits, like any health insurance, yeah. like life insurance, disability insurance, workers' compensation. Okay. But Lily, you so, can't be a service worker and get this. You have to have capital. So there are restrictions that go beyond no, what you're saying. there's no restrictions if you earn under $315,000. Right. So that creates a huge question for the vast majority of the American population, which is not simplification. Well, there, there, there is some evidence on how people respond to differences between taxation of business income and uh, wages and salaries. Uh, you know, famously, John Edwards and Newt Gingrich got into trouble for trying to avoid the 2.9% uh, Medicare payroll tax. They pretended that their income was return on, it was basically business income rather than compensation. Uh, Donald Trump hasn't, we haven't seen his income tax returns, uh, but it, it, uh, the, he, filed a, he filed a financial disclosure form and in the year in which he was, uh, you know, at his peak with, on the Apprentice program, which I hear is a very popular program back in the day, uh, and also heading this, what he said was a very successful multinational organization, he reported $14,000 of wages. And if, actually, if that's what he reported on his income tax return, there's no, I'm not surprised that he's being audited because that was kind of wrong. Uh, but it would have saved him a lot of taxes. And that was at a 2.9% differential. 37% tax rate, if you can deduct 20% of that, that means you take 7.4% off. So your effective rate is instead of 37%, it's 30%, plus you save payroll taxes too. There's a huge incentive to try to take advantage of that loophole. Now it is true that there are these guardrails that are built around it, and there's lawyers have proven themselves to be incredibly effective at finding ways to take advantage of such differentials. It's just not a good idea. And there wasn't really any, any economic reason to do it in the first place. Other, the, the imperative was political. They say, well, we're going to cut corporate taxes because corporations are overtaxed relative to pass-throughs. And then the pass-throughs say, well, that's not fair. You should cut our taxes, too. Okay. And, and, so, and I'm, I'm a little scared here because you guys understand this stuff better than that. But as I understand it, if I... 
instead of drawing a salary from the New York Times, become a contractor, Krugmanomics LLC, which sells the service of column writing to the New York Times, that then becomes a pass-through business. Now, that, according to the guardrails, does not qualify. It's for providing a service. But if it operates out of an office building that I own, and it pays exorbitant rent to my real estate company, uh, so that Krugmanomics and LLC barely makes any money at all, but my real estate company makes an enormous amount from that gets to the, me the big tax break. And if I can come up with that, you can just imagine what highly paid tax lawyers are going to come up with. Okay. Okay. So, so actually, that's right. You can just form Krugman LLC if you make up to three hundred and fifteen thousand dollars, and as long as you give up being an employee, no problem. But above that, hopefully you're making more than that. Then you need to create your real estate. Tax well, shelter, you know, the, uh, IRS, the IRS has an overarching rule that says if you engage in any activity that's for tax purposes, saving taxes, you're, you're subject to criminal charges. So oh, I no, that's not true. Well, from what I understand. It's the economic substance doctrine, but it's barely ever successful in well, the courts, so Renning, they have a 1% audit rate. Paul Renning himself just to sit in a, a huge amount, just to sit in a small office, or even a big office, won by himself to uh, write his columns, I, I don't see that as gonna pass the test. Okay, are we ready for some audience questions? Because they've got really good <laughs> questions. Oh, okay, God. and here's, here's the first one. Uh, is there a point at which our debt will begin to freak out, I love that term, the equity market? And I guess this is almost look like an investment question. Any idea when, like I'll ride the rally. <laughs> 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 so who and, wants to jump in? <laughs> I, I can answer that one. Our debt is 200 trillion. Uh, it's not 20 trillion, it's 200 trillion. That's the fiscal gap. That's the present value difference between all the projected outlays projected by the CBO and all the projected receipts. 200 trillion were short. That's 10% of GDP forever. So the country's absolutely bank bankrupt. We're probably in the worst fiscal shape of, uh, of any uh, developed country, certainly any developed country, probably worse than Greece. Uh, to tell you the truth. And that's because we've been keeping all these obligations off the books. If you just look at the Social Security uh, trustees report that came out in July, they're reporting a $34 trillion unfunded liability. That's you know, much bigger than the $20, 20 trillion in official debt. So we need it. So we are broke and we were broke decades ago. And we have to do fiscal gap accounting, not deficit accounting. If you go to an, a website called theinformact.org, T-H-E-I-N-F-O-R-A-C-T, I-N-F-O-R-M-M-A-C-T, theinformact.org, you'll see that 20 Nobel Prize winners, I hope Paul is gonna uh, make it 21, uh, have endorsed doing fiscal gap accounting on a routine basis because the other accounting that we're doing is completely arbitrary, has no economic basis, and when Shakespeare said, first shoot the lawyers, he should have said, first shoot the accountants. Okay. okay. Um, I have a one-word answer, which is Japan. You want to think about, you know, Japan is your pessimal case. I mean, Japan has debt, which is, face debt is 200% of GDP. Uh, they have obligations. They have demographics that make ours look... Uh, like paradise. They have a, a working age population that's shrinking at one and a half percent a year. They are paying no risk premium at all on their bonds. Um, people, the, the trade, shorting Japanese debt, people used to do that a lot, assuming there had to be hitting a limit, and um, the, the trade ended up being called the widow maker. I don't know if anybody actually committed suicide over losing money from it, but it, it, it was always a bad. It, advanced country, markets appear to believe that advanced countries that borrow in their own currency and have reasonably stable governments and are not run by, idi by complete idiots, I don't know if we're, <laughs> we may have lost ourselves here, but anyway, they uh, um, have awesome capability to get their house in order and are willing to give them enormous amounts of can I Can I nitpick just a little bit, but don't the Japanese own a lot of their own debt and don't a lot of their, their citizens they, buy the debt and hold even the Even the net debt is still, is still Greek level. So I. I mean, it, it is true that Japanese debt is very high, and it's also true that most of it, unlike our debt, is, uh, or almost all of it is, is held by Japanese people. But the thing that actually scares me is that there won't be any response for a long time. And we are the, still the richest country in the world. We have a lot of capacity to borrow. Uh, and policymakers have clearly decided that while they really care a lot about deficits when the other party is in power, uh, they don't when they are. And 
And they haven't had to really pay much of a price for it because interest rates are so low. There's a lot of capital available in the, in the rest of the world. I think it would be better if there were a market response right away. If interest rates started to go up, that would affect equity prices. That actually happened in the early 1980s. 1981, Reagan passed a tax cut that was much bigger than this one. Uh, and, and interest rates started to go up. And people on Wall Street, including influential Republicans like John Snow as head of CSX, a future Republican Treasury Secretary, went to Reagan and said, these high interest rates are killing us. And people don't remember that even though he passed the, the big, uh, a huge tax cut, he also passed really big tax increases in 82, 83, and 84. And he actually gave an impassioned speech saying that we have to, we have to deal with this or else we're going to wreck our economy. Uh, if we don't see an interest rate response, you can imagine debt going up to 200, 250% of GDP. And uh, Paul actually had a, uh, said something a long time ago that haunts me, this wily e. Coyote moment where the roadrunner is running along, this is our debt, the metaphor for our debt, and then all of a sudden realizes he's over the cliff. And then, the fiscal cliff, yeah. with a pause, falls. Uh, and I, 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 I want to actually fall when we're just on a, a, slight, in, a, slight, a, a slight incline rather than a cliff. Uh, but if it doesn't happen until, there are economic models where interest rates stay really low, it's basically the mortgage bubble model. Basically, everybody says, uh, in the mortgage, the mortgage market, it was uh, house prices were growing at 15% a year. Mortgagers could lend money to anybody. It was profitable. They could just foreclose if they couldn't make their payments. And that worked for as long as mortgage price, as house prices increased at 15% a year. Once house prices stopped growing, then lending standards tightened, which meant that there were more foreclosures, which reduced the demand, which pushed down housing prices. And then there was a crash. You can imagine the same thing. If interest rates are two or three percent, we can borrow yeah. five five hundred percent of GDP. If interest rates start to go up, we're a less good risk. And you could imagine very, very quickly our foreign lenders deciding that uh, that 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 it's not that we're, we're no longer the safe investment. Okay. And we don't. Unfortunately, we don't know when that happens. But the farther in the future it is, the worse it's going to be. Okay. Um, I would just like to say that um, my uh, observation over the years watching financial markets is that this is totally the kind of thing that won't be a problem until it is. It's sort of like when your doctor says, you've got to, you can't drink so much wine, you've got to not eat that, you've got to do this, you're, or you're going to have a heart attack. Well, a lot of people, until they get the heart attack, they don't really change their ways, and I think investors are kind of like that, you know? And, and your question is very apt, because that's what everybody's asking themselves. How long can I ride this? Keep, you know, keep looking, because, you know, as long as it's going up, it's going to go up, and it's just very difficult to ever predict what's going to change that. Yeah, just, just to reinforce that, I, I spoke to about 50 bond traders about a year ago, explaining to them how broke the country was, and they, they came around to the view that I was right, and, and then they asked me at the end, you know, can you tell me five minutes before the other traders learn this? <laughs> or not that they learn it, when they trade on it. So all the traders are trading on what they think other traders are trading. Keynes told us that uh, if you lose money in a group, you s keep your job. If you lose money by yourself, you lose your job. And, and Bill Gross from PIMCO lost his job because he, he basically bet on the realities and not what other people were, were saying. So this thing has the potential to, to, to change in an instant, well, just like you yeah. were saying. Yeah, we'll see. The heart attack and hit. OK, um, let's move on to this question. I think uh, we, we've kind of touched on. Um, but I'm, what do you think of the impact of eliminating the other deductions, the state and local, the interest payments, et cetera? And I think maybe that's where it is worth going a little bit into because I think you all share a concern about what this is going to mean for programs that are so important to so many people and that it's going to make it much harder for many states and localities to fund really important things. Anybody want to jump in? Uh, I'm not sure if the question was just about state and local tax deduction, but uh, one interesting thing about the bill is how many fewer people are going to itemize deductions, and that actually is probably going to have a, a significant effect on charitable giving, because there'll be a lot less people who are claiming charitable deductions, um, and there's some evidence that, that people do respond to that. Um, there's also, of course, the reduction in the home mortgage interest deduction. Um, 
which uh, you know may have some small effect on home prices. Yeah. And then uh, you know going to the state and local tax deduction issue again. That's just going to create a huge amount of uncertainty in the states that are contemplating different legislation. Um, but generally, the state and local tax deduction was a pretty regressive deduction. So um, losing that is something that is disproportionately affecting more wealthy people. I think it's really hard to tell what the effect is. I think people are concerned that if the state and local tax deduction is limited, that high income people are going to be less supportive of public programs or require higher taxes. And it's certainly possible. I think Larry alluded to that in his comments. We don't really have any empirical evidence on it, although I guess we will get some. But one point to make is that the state and local tax deduction was already limited under prior law, and that was by the alternative minimum tax. And a significant fraction of upper income, upper middle and upper income people uh, were not getting the full benefit of the state and local tax deduction, or maybe even any at all, because uh, the way, I guess this is more, that one of the bad things about our tax system, which actually wasn't fixed in this bill, is that you have to calculate your taxes two ways. One is under one set of rules where you can deduct state and local taxes and other things. Another is under this alternate set of rules where state and local taxes were not allowed. That's the alternative minimum tax. And if you owed higher tax under the second standard, then that was what governed your tax liability. Uh, it's true that few, many fewer people are going to be subject to the AMT, but it was. The AMT already limited state and local tax deductions for a lot of high-income people, uh, so maybe the impact is, is less less severe than, okay. than people are expecting. I, I think the whole question of what do we ultimately mean by regressivity comes in here as well. I mean, state and local tax deduction directly tend to benefit up relatively high-income people in blue states. So in that sense, getting rid of it is hitting people who are pretty affluent, my neighbors basically, right? Uh, the um, but what do blue states do with the revenue they raise? The answer is, well, they actually spend more on education. They spend more on social programs. So if you take in the ultimate indirect effects on programs, it, I think eliminating probably ends up being regressive, ends up hurting uh, you know, the, it, the, the, the cost to the, uh, to the kids who won't be get preschool programs is going to be a, a much more important factor than the cost to the, to the doctors and lawyers who are not getting to the, the, the deductions they were getting before. Okay. Um, let's try to do a little bit more of a, a lightning round because there's a few more questions. So, what if there was a middle ta a, a radical tax cut for the middle class? I was kind of touching on this. I think not the top segment of income earners. Wouldn't this benefit the economy and people in new ways? Give it one more time. Okay. What if there was a, a radical tax for the middle class? Right. Okay, and in fact, we were talking about how little it was. What if, what if when, in this whole bill, say, someone had just said, ah, oh, let's really slash taxes for lower income people, right? Would this benefit, or this actually wouldn't this benefit the economy and people in some new ways? So let's get a quick comment from everybody on that. Uh, no, no, we have a government. We want the government to do things. It means we have to collect taxes. And that includes middle class people. Uh, the idea that there, there is, why are we cutting taxes? We have these responsibilities, so no. Okay. Uh, so a net tax cut I think would be a bad idea. One of the things the bill didn't deal with was the stagnating, uh, stagnating incomes at the middle and bottom. And I actually have a paper that I'm working on proposing a value-added tax to pay for a wage credit that would benefit low and middle income workers. Basically it would offset what the market's not doing. And I think one of the big challenges for us going forward is figuring out how we can deal with an economic system that really is just leaving large swaths of the population behind. So I think not the net tax cut, but doing something for the people in the middle would be a good thing. Lily? I think it depends. Uh, so if it was paid for, um, if it was a big tax cut for the middle class paid for by uh, higher taxes on the wealthy, then probably. Um, if it was not paid for, but it was particularly well targeted, you know, if it was a child care tax credit that was really going to improve the quality of child care investments. Um, those have a lot of long-term positive impacts on children er earnings. So I think it's possible, but it would really depend on the details. Okay. Hello, there we go. That must be, he asked the question. There we go. Well, I think we can fix the tax system dramatically in, in a much better way than was just done. We, we have very considerable inequality, uh, spending inequality. It's much less than wealth inequality because the, the fiscal system is progressive, labor earnings are more progressively distributed than wealth, but we still have a huge problem in inequality. You can see that on the streets of New York with people begging 
So we need to, we need to um, ad address this, but we also have to understand that we're addressing everything piecemeal. We have about 21 different federal and state programs that are, uh, each of which is a f different fiscal system. Okay. Think about food stamps. If you earn too much money on food stamps, you lose 22, three, 23 cents on the dollar. You lose 22 cents on the dollar from the earned income tax credit. You lose 15.3% on the dollar from the payroll tax. So if you're a poor person, forgetting the income tax, you're a poor person, you're already in like a 50% marginal tax bracket, taking into account include New York City sales taxes. All these things impact your incentive to work. So we need to have a reform that, that uh, actually ends up putting everybody into a tax bracket that's not crazy high, that doesn't lock poor people into poverty. Now, if you want to see such a reform, and it would involve value-added taxes and a progressive consumption tax and a carbon tax, if you go to uh, my website, kotlikoff.net, I'll do a little free advertising. Okay, uh, so you've, it's, uh, wait, you've wait, also... It's called, there's a book called You're Hired, a Trump Playbook for Fixing America's Economy. Trump had nothing to do with it. Okay, you've also answered the second question, so you don't get to answer this one okay. in, the, in, the, in the tax round. If you could adopt, well, actually, you kind of did too, Lynn, but let's broadly, and it, only unless it's really quick. If you could adopt a tax code from another country, which country would it be and, or not be? But I also think more broadly, ideal, ideal tax, if you, if you were given the, you know, the, the tax are, and you get to just put in, in a nutshell, what would your ideal tax system look like? I think you just told us a big part of yours, so we'll let these guys go. Okay, um, I'm going to sound like Bernie Sanders here. Uh, Denmark. Uh, um, you know, you, if you look at, at the, the northern European countries that have been much more successful at preserving a middle class than we have, uh, they actually, they have, their tax systems are not especially progressive. They rely heavily on, on value-added taxes, which are a slightly regressive thing, but they use that to finance a lot of benefits that go way up the income scale. And... <clears throat> That's the way to do it. I mean, their tax systems are, are relatively flat, uh, so the, the, the disincentives created by the tax system are not that bad. They are used to finance strongly progressive social programs, which because they're not as severely means tested as ours, don't create those really high marginal tax rates at low incomes either. So yeah, I mean, um, uh, uh, yeah, I, Denmark with better weather. I hate to agree with you, Paul. Oh dear. <laughs> oh, I must have screwed up. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I, I mean, the key point is that you shouldn't just look at the tax system. You should look at the spending system, too. I and mean, everybody else, except for oil countries and failed states, have a value-added tax. And it's not because they hate poor people, but because it finances essential government services. And it does it in a way that doesn't take a huge toll from the economy. So you're saying you're in favor of a consumption tax that, uh, that is progressive. No? Did I misunderstand? Yeah. yeah, I think just focusing on, on the tax system to do everything, I think, is wrong. Uh, but they we're also not Denmark. We're not going to have taxes of 50% of GDP and, you know, having the social compact that the government will provide so much and people, for the most part, are willing to pay very high taxes to pay for it is probably not going to happen in okay. the U.S. Billy? Uh, I mean, I'd agree that I tend to look at the fiscal system together, so both the tax and spending programs, and to some degree, uh, it doesn't always make a difference which one it is, but in general, I think we should be, um, you know, raising... Uh, asking the wealthy to pay more and investing more in low to middle income families, particularly things like child care, paid leave. Um, I think we should get rid of the stepped up basis loophole. I could run through a whole list, but it'll get really nerdy for everyone. Okay, then we're, we're supposed to finish, but I have to ask this last question. And again, really quick, who, okay, what do you think is happening with public opinion? Will this help the Republicans or the Democrats this November? So I don't, I don't, th I don't think anybody knows that uh, there was a big tax cut as part of the economic stimulus that Barack Obama pushed through, and the majority of voters, according to a poll, thought that their taxes had gone up. Uh, so <laughs> it will be interesting to see how this plays out in 2018. I, I think, yeah, the, the uh, it's so complicated, and the, um, there are a few other things in the news which are kind of, kind of <laughs> distract. I mean, it's kind of a, you know, we used to talk about, you know, the one week news cycle and then the one day, and now it's kind of a two hour news cycle. I have a, a suspicion that, that this tax law is just gonna be, is, is gonna be totally swamped by other stuff. Well, the Russians really like it. <laughs> Anybody else wanna weigh in? 
I, I think it'll modestly hurt the Republicans. Um, I mean, I think people are understanding that this is pretty tilted towards the wealthy, but I, I've also seen polling that basically support for the bill almost perfectly correlates with support for the president. So I, I think this is capturing a lot of other things beyond taxes. Yeah, I think the record suggests that, or I've heard this, that if you um, if you lose relative to other people, you're unhappy about any tax change. If you're both losing together, you're okay, or both getting, winning together. And, th and one of the things we haven't talked about is the fact that there's so many different things going on in this bill that there's a certain amount of dispersion. For, if you look within the same cohort, within the same level of resources, you've got some households are getting an 8% increase in spending and some are having a negative 2% increase in spending. And I think that's gonna to lead to some animosity and some anger. Okay. And well, it should. Well, thank you. Janet. Another happy birthday to Janet Gornick and Paul Krugman. <laughs>